So we're getting back to working on the C18 here, folks. And some of the questions I get are, what are the differences between a C18 and a C15? This is one, the block stiffener plate on a C18 is more similar to the 3406B style ones where it's a full width block stiffener plate or ladder plate that goes between the oil pan and the block there. The cooling jets are a big difference here. They're much larger, much wider on the C18 here. I'll show you a picture of the C15 style ones, which both nozzles on those are pretty close, but they use the same style retaining bolt, which is that kind of half bolt there. Pretty interesting design. And what we're gonna be doing here, folks, is pulling the pistons out. Now, can you pull the cylinder pack and the piston all at once? Yes, if you have a cylinder pack puller, but generally I pull the piston out. We're doing number three and four here. You can see the wilds of North Idaho behind us. And we're gonna focus on number four here because I'm gonna be pushing that one out too. And I think you're gonna find something very interesting if you really focus on number four here after we pull it out. And it's always helpful to have an assistant here, although this guy's not my assistant. He is the uh, one of the employees here for the customer and he's kind of the one that's in charge of this job. So what you're seeing here is this is the ring gaps, how it pulled out, I believe this was number three, but look at them. They're almost exactly lined up. That's just how the engine was running like that. And let's look at the other one here. I believe this one's number four. And you can see the top and oil control ring are almost lined up. And the middle ring is about 60 degrees off. So ring gaps, folks, they're going to move around and do whatever they want. There's not much you can do about them. Uh, yeah. So what we're doing here is after you've pulled the pistons out, you can start pulling the liners out. And that leads us to a question, and that I was actually asked this on this job. What holds the liners in? Well, really nothing. They are retained with the head off with just the seals. But with the head on and the head bolts torqued, well, that's really what holds the liners in. The top ring or flange on the liner sits on the engine block, and then the head with the head gasket between it pushes down on them and forces them in place. So with the head gasket out of the way, or I should say the head, you can pull the liners out. Now, it is not easy to do, as you can see I'm using this tool. It would be pretty much impossible for you to just pull these liners out. The O-rings, well, although they're more like rubber bands on this guy, but the O-rings actually hold them in quite tightly. And I've even had, not this particular style tool, but the cylinder pack pullers actually just stop because the O-rings are just not letting them move out. So what I'm doing here is this basically pulls them out. Now, one thing you don't want to do is, especially on the first one you're pulling, is be underneath it because usually there's coolant in place there. So what you want to do is usually put a pan under there because when you pull that liner out, usually you're going to lose a bunch of coolant. Didn't really lose much on this one, but there's the liner. Now, the liner itself is the outside diameter is the same as on a C15 or 3406E. But the inner diameter, the bore, is different on the C18. You can see the, uh, look how thin these th seals are. They're basically rubber bands almost. They're, uh, because the block's the same basically from a C15 to a C18, you can't have the full size O-rings because the liner itself is so much thinner on a C18. So what you might be thinking, what well, makes more power you, and you have a thinner liner? Yes, yes you do. You have a much thinner liner, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. So, and also cavitation, if you're gonna get cavitation, usually it's on the exhaust side, which would be the right side, which is kind of what I was pointing out there. So basically, yeah, that's all you have to do once they're out, uh, and you could see the cooling jets had been removed already. You always wanna pull cooling jets before pulling the piston packs out, uh, or the pistons, I should say. You don't want the connecting rod contacting them and potentially damaging the cooling jet. They're expensive, but also if you damage it and reuse it, that could, really do some damage to the engine. So basically same procedure as we did on the last one, just gonna pull it up and then pull the liner out, which gets us to our next segment here, which is once you have the liners out, you can really get the deck, the block much cleaner. And you have a really good view of the fly cut marks, the machining marks where they mill these blocks, you see them? And you can actually feel them with your uh, bare hands there. And remember number four was the one that had the firing damage? Look at that. That whole section of the block is basically gone. The fly cut marks are gone. I'm not sure exactly 
what causes that? Like, why does this one wear more than, let's say, number five? It, it's hard to say. Something wears there. This one actually was the point where it's pushing combustion gases past there, and probably the combustion gases were helping to, or not helping, but I should say hurting the block by passing through there and getting into the cooling system. Oh, boy. A fun box. What do we got here? Monaco Tools. What did I buy? Yeah, I bought this, folks. Not a, not a freebie here. And I finally got, which I probably should have bought a few months ago, my very own counter bore cutter. Oh yeah, 5139. So they, Monaco makes two different counter bore cutters. There's like the full width base one, and then there's this one, which is kind of more specific to the cat ones. I went with this one for a couple reasons. Apparently the full width base ones can hit the front structure on certain engines. I didn't want to find out, uh, so I got this one. This one's also nice because you don't have to pull the dowel pins to cut counter bores, which is not a huge deal, but it's just one less thing you have to worry about. And I've got a couple videos on cutting counter bores, folks, so this is not necessarily going to be a tutorial on how to cut counter bores, but this uh, new tool here, very nice. I'm glad they make them red now. I've seen the purple ones, which I, I would prefer red over purple. Your preference may vary on that one. But yeah, out of the box here, we're cutting, and it cut really straight, really happy with Monaco. Uh, when I worked at Western States, they also had a Monaco counterbore cutter, and that's kind of where I learned about this company. They're actually in Oregon, Eugene, Oregon. All these are made in the United States. Pretty, uh, pretty cool deal there in a world where, well, not many things are made here anymore. But uh, yeah, so basically the basics, I'll just kind of go through it here, and you can see we're on number three cylinder, is there's two collars. The black rings here, you can see I keep adjusting the lower one. So the lower one determines your cut depth, and your top one determines your stopping point. So what you do, and like I said, I have a full video on this, but basically you get it set up, you put a feeler gauge between the two collars. I was using a 29 thousandths because I'm trying to cut the 29 thousandths. You then just cut with the cutting bit, and then you're moving the lower collar one tick at a time back, and that all that does is it cuts about a thousandths at a time. Now, you can cut more than that if you want. If you want to cut two thousandths, uh, I wouldn't go more than that, really. I usually cut at a thousandths because I found two thousandths can cause some chattering. With this sharp bit, I ended up, I did do a few at two thousandths there, uh, at the end, but generally I like to cut a thousands at a time. It is very tedious. It's not a fun process to cut counter bores, folks. As you can see, this sped up, I think, 300% or something. And this is just one hole. Yep, we're doing all six on this one. So, yeah, it's very tedious. But definitely a necessary process. And you can see there's little metal shavings that kind of throws everywhere. If you look on the very left side of the screen, I've got a red cap on that single dowel there. You might notice the red cap's there, but there's none anywhere else. That dowel on the far left, which would be the front left of the engine block, is the oil supply to the cylinder head. So I always cap those when cutting counterboards because the last thing you want to do is get any of these little metal shavings in there, and then they get pushed right into the cam bearings on your new head, or even if you're reusing the head, you don't want those there. I also put these brake chamber diaphragms down the cylinder bores. It catches 90-ish percent of the metal shavings here from going into the bore. There's really no 100% way um, that I know of to seal off that lower section area. The metal shavings, they get into the cooling uh, jackets here, but basically what I'm doing now is I'm using my Milwaukee bat battery-powered uh, vacuum here, which I really like. And last video, folks, I'm sorry when I was using the Milwaukee Impacts, I kept saying IR, which of course stands for Ingersoll Rand. I have no idea why I was saying that. I don't even own any IR electric tools. Um, I own a lot of IR air tools, but I haven't. I almost never use air tools anymore. Pretty much everything is Milwaukee now. For whatever reason, it was stuck in my mind, though. Sorry about that. I think I got like 100 comments saying, they're not IR, they're Milwaukee. Yes, I I know that, but I messed up when saying it. Okay, so we'd cut to our full depth. So basically the, the bottom black collar there on the cutting tool reached the top collar, which means we should be at about 29 thousandths. Now one nice thing about this tool with the smaller base here is you can actually, or at least depending on what one you're using, I've got a depth mic, and what I'm doing is I can measure the cut without taking the machine off, which is really nice. 
because if you have to remove the machine and then place it back on there, that's a real pain. That really extends the cut time per cylinder. So I can slide it underneath between the ledges here and get my readings. And I'll show you that just in a second, what I'm looking at. And if it measures between 29 and 30 thousandths, we're good to go. So we're just looking at the other side of where I was standing there. And you can see, yeah, the cutting tool still set up. We're on number three cylinder here. I'll zoom in. But yeah, look at that. We are just over 29 thousandths cut depth. So this is a depth micrometer. It's measuring in thousandths of an inch. And yeah, what I'm shooting for is between 29 and 30. I don't want it at 27 because then you get too much protrusion and I don't want it at 31 because then you might not get enough. So I've found about 29 to 30, usually you get about 5 thousandths protrusion, which is just about perfect. You don't want to really go much over six, although some people say you want more than six, but cat specification is not that, it's one to six. So look at this line here, this is on number four. See the shiny to the dull part? That was after six thousandths cut, so that worn out part of the block there where it showed you before after cleaning that section was over six thousands gone on the block so yeah really needed on number four so we cut them all they all cut very well about 29 29 and a half every single spot that i measured so very very happy with my monaco tools uh cutter there and yeah they, they make them for more than just the cat they make them for cummins and uh, apparently there's other manufacturers other than cat supposedly that's just a rumor but anywho let's get back to work here so what we're doing here is pulling our main bearings not my favorite job you can see i'm using the milwaukee uh one inch impact that i bought basically for doing main bearings but also you can pull head bolts and stuff out with them and yeah i not like I said, not super, super impressed with the one inch impact from Milwaukee here, this this style one. I don't think I'd buy the big heavy duty tire gun one either. It's just too big and bulky for doing mains. Like well, that on a truck application, you probably wouldn't be able to get it over the axle. So the one inch will remove them and torque turn them, but um, I, I expect it to hit a little harder than it, well, not a little harder, a lot harder than it does. It's not much stronger than the half inch. Now, we're going to be comparing later the new Milwaukee half inch, uh, the slightly smaller, supposedly higher torque half inch, and it's pretty impressive, folks. Uh, it's not mine. It's the other guy in the videos here. Uh, we're going to compare that to uh, turning the mains by hand with a big old torque wrench, but yeah, as you can see, uh, I'm doing four. I usually do mains in a set, so I'll do four and then three, and there's seven mains. So I'll usually do two, three, five, and six mains. Once those are in, then I'll do one, four, and seven. Do you have to do it that way? Of course not. You could do it a variety of ways, uh, as long as you're reinstalling them in the correct place, uh, being careful to torque and torque turn them properly, not damage the crankshaft. There's, you know, if you wanted to do one at a time, uh, some people do all seven at once. I don't necessarily recommend that because nothing then is holding the crank in other than the front and rear main seals, which I would be a little nervous about holding that extremely heavy crank up with the main seals. Now, we are going to be replacing the main seals, not in this video, but uh, you could, if you wanted, Leave the crank in with all the mains out. I do not recommend that, though, because the last thing you want to do is damage a main seal just because you didn't want to leave a couple mains in. And, yeah, you, as you can see, I'm just basically rolling them out here, rolling the new ones in. Yeah, well, we're not rolling the new ones in yet. We're still rolling them out, the uppers. You know, mains, It's sometimes getting the uppers out is a real pain in the butt. These actually weren't too bad. They came out pretty easy. And I'm just spraying off. There was just trying to get any debris off of the crank before we do anything with rolling the new mains in. And you could say, well, Josh, you're wearing, why are you wearing a sweater? Isn't it summer? Yeah, this was late August. And it was quite cool. I think the low, low on this day was in the 40s. So, yeah, we are, uh, we're not exactly in Arizona here, folks. 
North Idaho, about 100 miles south of Canada. And apparently people live north of the Canadian border also. That's just a rumor also that I've heard. And uh, it, it can apparently get colder there as well, depending on where you're at. It's hard to believe. Hard for me to believe after some of the winters here. So what we're going to be doing here is looking at our Snap-on three-quarter digital torque wrench. The guy here wanted to try it out. He would bought this and never used it. So what we're going to see is the torque turning ability of this guy to see if we can torque turn these mains by hand. Now, of course, you can do that, but it is extremely difficult, especially by yourself, to turn it because if you're turning it by hand, you can't really look at the lines here. And what we're trying to do is turn it at 120 degrees after torquing it to 190 just listen for the beep. There we go. Yeah, it works. We'd set it to 120 degrees. You can kind of see the flat lines up with the line there. So yeah, it works for doing torque turning. Doesn't mean it's easy. This would be, like I said, almost impossible. Not impossible. It would be much more difficult by yourself by turning it by hand. Now, could you do it? Yes, I did it with the torque multiplier. That was more difficult surprisingly the milwaukee half inch that i had which was the older heavier style one would torque turn the mains and of course i've got my one inch one but what we're going to be doing and it's hard to tell here but he's given this almost everything he's got the torque that it said it was about was about 550 according to the torque wrench now of course it's reading torque turn but the nice thing about the digital it will tell you applied torque so yeah it's putting out almost the max calculated rating on that torque wrench which is i believe this torque wrench goes up to 600 foot pounds so yeah it's a lot it takes a lot to turn those mains i mean that's more than the lug nuts torque do for example on most trucks so yeah those it turned them fine and now what we're going to be doing is the Milwaukee new half inch. A little more. So this is a, um, and he's using a 5 amp hour battery, folks. 5 amp hour battery, Milwaukee socket, Milwaukee new half inch impact. That, it is quite impressive, and it's smaller profile than the, uh, the older Milwaukee. Not sponsored by Milwaukee, but man, that's uh, that's pretty impressive, folks. That's going to be pretty much the repairs for this video, folks. How about a little destruction of the week? This week's destruction of the week comes from a man named Pavel, and he said he's running cat injectors on 1 through 3 and aftermarket on 4 through 6.